to make a really fast run. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. Tonight we're looking at part three of Miracles and Money. <coughs> Sorry about that cough. Acts chapter 28, looking at verses 7 through 10. I'll begin reading in verse 6. Howbeit they looked a great look when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. So tonight we're talking about miracles and money, part three, which ties in well what we've been studying in Acts. And as I've said before, what becomes clearer and clearer to me the longer I live is that things of earth slow you down, or things of earth may be the reason you die. So if you want to collect things of earth, remember that that collecting process creeps, creeps up on you. And uh, I know that because I had a family and we started building up especially clothes, humongous amounts of clothes as the kids got bigger and the little ones were wearing the stuff the big ones wore, but the big ones had to get new stuff too. And so we have this humongous amount of clothing. It builds up on you. It creeps up on you. But don't let it tie you down in your service for Christ. And I gave you a principle last week. There's a very important principle in relation to all of this. And the principle is this. It's not what you own, but no matter of how you view what you own. You can own a lot of stuff, but if you treat it as a stewardship, not as a personal possession, then you view it correctly. But if you are greedy, if you are covetous, you're in trouble. Because a, a rich man can be perfectly content and not at all covetous, and a poor man can have deadly covetousness. It's how you view what you own. And we talked about Job last week, and he was rich, uh, but God didn't condemn him for it because God is the one who gave it to him. You know, the, the Old Testament tells us that it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Remember that. It is God that giveth thee the power to to get wealth. It's not because you're smart, uh, not because you've worked things out and because you managed to pull off some really cool things. It is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. And if he gives it to you, you have a greater stewardship responsibility than the man who only has a little bit. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. To whom little is given, from him shall little be required. So if you have much, in whatever realm, especially in the temporal realm, if you have much, God is going to hold you more accountable than the one to whom he gave only a little bit because it is God that gives you the power to get wealth. And Job understood this. Job put it together, and he treated everything that God had given him as a stewardship. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, and char nor charged God foolishly. Last week we also talked about some other people who didn't quite have that perspective. We talked about Judas. That was a man who always had his needs met when he was with Jesus. But, you know, even there Judas thought that he was poor. He didn't like it. He wanted to have more. He figured if he was in the inner circle of Christ's disciples, he ought to be riding high on the hog. After all, isn't that how powerful people, you know, they get a lot of money for themselves and all the people around them are in there for power and money and all the other good stuff that comes with it? Judas fell away. He's an example of an apostate. We talked about how he carried the bag. He didn't care for the poor, but he was a thief, John 12:6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bare what was put therein. The incident of Mary breaking that pound of ointment of spikenard over Jesus really made him mad. And of course, we talked about how Judas decided he was going to get his cut. He would get his 10%. It was worth 300 pieces of silver. And what did he sell Jesus for? 30 pieces of silver. 
Oh, I hope none of us are like that. We talked about the attitude of contentment and how important that is. We saw that in Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. He says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, or say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Contentment. That's a hard one. Have you ever felt discontent? Like, you really weren't happy with the way things were. You wanted things to be different. You know, we want things to be different in a lot of ways, don't we? We're not happy about our work. We're not happy about the house we live in. We're not happy about the car we drive. We're not happy about the yacht that we wish we had and don't. (laughs) We're not happy about some personal relationship. We're not happy about the way things are going at the church. That's one that gets me a lot. Contentment. Learning to say, I'm doing what God called me to do, and the results, it just doesn't matter. What matters is that I please Christ. Discontent, that's one of the devil's tools. But contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. For certain we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. With food and raiment let us be content. And most of us want a whole lot more than that. We talked about that in Philippians chapter 4. We'll not go over that again. We talked about that over in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So that's where I want to start tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is talking there about money and apostates, which is what our theme is, miracles and money. (coughs) Money and apostates. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. That's what Judas was like. From such withdraw thyself. Do you like to rub shoulders with rich people? A lot of people do. They want to be considered a friend of the rich. Because after all, the rich throw parties. And the rich do fun things. And if you can get in on some of that fun things, then it doesn't cost you anything. From such, withdraw thyself. (laughs) Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich. Is that one of your goals? That's expressing a desire here. The first few words of that are the expression of a desire. But they that will be rich, that's their desire. They fall into temptation. The Lord's Prayer. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? You all know the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, right. I think everybody raised their hand. Okay. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What does it say here? They that will be rich fall into temptation. God's not the one who leads you into temptation, is he? Is he? No. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When you have the desire to get rich, you know what? That's leading you into temptation. More than that, it's not just temptation. It's a snare. A snare is a trap that catches an animal and then that kills it. It's a snare like a noose snare that snaps around a rabbit's neck and strangles him. You have a desire for money? You want to be rich? It moves you into temptation and it moves you into a snare and it moves you into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what he's going to tell you in the next verse. Moves you into hurtful lusts. What are the things else that it leads you to desire? I've got money. Now I can go after this. I've got money. Now I can go after that. I've got money. Now I can go after that. I loved money. And it leads you into many other different types of sin. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. What is perdition? 
damnation. That's exactly right. It's one of the roads to hell. That inordinate desire for money. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. There's your apostasy. The apostates, that is one of their chief focuses, is how can they manipulate God's people to get money out of them? Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so, O man of God, you know, it's not too bad if you get into it every now and then. Doesn't he say that in verse 11? Uh, It's okay if you stand there and look at it. It's okay if you walk toward it and hold hands with it. Is that what it says? But thou, O man of God, what? Flee these things. You are to act in a direct and positive manner against those things. You run away from them. And you are to follow after righteousness. Here's the opposite of what you've been looking at that leads to apostasy. Follow after (coughs) (coughs) righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Do you realize you're going to have to fight to do this? Fight the good fight of faith. You know, it's not natural to want to fight against the love of money. Your body, your soul, your flesh wants money. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You've said it with your mouth. Are you living it with your life? We see another very interesting context, and this is where we closed last week. Hebrews 13. Marriage is honorable in all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. He goes from talking about whoremongers and adulterers to covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, Jesus is with you just like he was with Judas, but Judas wasn't content. Has Jesus promised to never leave us nor forsake us? Has he? He's promised it, hasn't he? That he will never leave us or forsake us. Why would we want to be like Judas? Jesus didn't give up on Judas. Judas gave up on Jesus. Judas sat at the table at that final Passover when Jesus took off his robe, girded himself with a towel, and took a basin and washed the feet of the disciples. Jesus washed Judas' feet. And Judas turned around and went out, and it was night, and Satan entered into him, and he betrayed Jesus. Tonight, the apostates are like Judas, They are like Ananias and Sapphira. They are like Elymas the sorcerer and others. They will do whatever is necessary, including lying and stealing from the church, faking donations to the church, which is what Ananias and Sapphira did. They'll do whatever is necessary. They perform charlatan miracles like sleight-of-hand magicians and demonically empowered miracles to get money, to get sex, to get power, to get other personal carnal benefits. Did you know that God has given two full chapters in the New Testament, and many illustrations, such as the sons of Sceva, who practiced exorcism for money, and Simon the sorcerer, who wanted to buy the power to give the Holy Spirit by laying on of hands to warn us about such people. There's a lot about this topic in the New Testament. 
Both Peter and Jude wrote entire chapters against the money and miracle charlatans. Peter makes it clear that their first motive for preaching heresy is covetousness. 2 Peter chapter 2 But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They make a bad testimony and make the world mock. Now look at verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. They'll sell you. They'll get the money out of you. That's like Judas, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Money, that's number one. You know, Paul gives another reason for preaching apostasy. Sex. Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, ah, there's covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, that's like parents have for their children and children for their parents, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now look at the next verse. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, never learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs, that is Janus and Jambres, as theirs also was. First motive for the charlatans is money. Second motive is sex. And you know the horrible stories of the various very famous charismatic leaders you know about the Jim and Tammy Baker situation you know about the guy down there in New Orleans can't remember his name right off the top of my head that got caught going into prostitutes down in New Orleans it's bizarre but it tells you exactly what they're like it tells you what things they teach it tells you what their character is like Peter gives three illustrations to show the character of the apostates one of which, at least one, focuses on perverted sex. The three illustrations he gives are the angels that followed Satan in his fall. There's the lust for power. He gives the illustration of the world in the days of Noah. That's rejection of the true God. And he gives the illustration of Sodom, which is lust for perverted sex apart from the divine standard for marriage. Listen to it. So back in Second Peter, that remember, two, two full chapters are given to these guys in the New Testament. That's why God wants us to know about them. Verse 4 of 2 Peter 2. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. There's illustration number 1. These are illustrations of what the apostates are like. 2 Peter is talking about the apostates. So he gives the illustration of the angels that sinned. And then he gives another illustration. And God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood of the, upon the world of the ungodly. There's your second illustration, that rejection of the true God. And then he gives a third illustration. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You know, it's amazing that he calls him just Lot. Righteous Lot? Lot was living there. But he didn't say much about it. It vexed his soul, though. <laughs> it bothered him, but he stayed. Why? Money, power. Just Lot? You mean the guy that tried to compromise and go to Zoar? When God told him to go to the mountains? Just Lot? Righteous Lot? The guy who committed incest with his two daughters? It tells you really how bad the apostates are. 
Verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous they are, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now this is the description of the apostates that he's doing here. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, those are acting like animals, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Now he's going to mention those same two character qualities that are the motivating factors for the apostates, the charlatans, the miracles and money crowd, spots and blemishes, and they sport themselves. They show themselves off while they're at your church dinners, while they feast with you. Now here's their motives. Having eyes full of adultery, there's the sex issue, and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. There's the money issue. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Back to the money issue again. The money and miracles crowd. A lot is said about them in the New Testament. You're to be warned against them. I mean, those charismatic revivals may seem like so exciting. Man, the Spirit of God must really be moving. Look at how many people they've got. Uh, look at the crowds. Look at people coming forward. Look at the healings that are going on. Smack on the forehead, fall on the, on the ground. You don't see that in the New Testament. Balaam. You remember Balaam? Balaam was hired by Balak, son of Basor, to curse the children of Israel. And so Balaam went up, did his incantations, and God said, you're not going to be able to curse them, you're going to only bless them. So as he stood before looking over part of Israel, he blessed them. Balak said, look, you can't do it. Uh, let's, let's go to look at a different part, see if you can curse them there. Balaam went through it again. He said, I, I've got to bless them. And he blessed them. They did it a third time, and he blessed them again. And Balaam got really, really, really mad. But Balaam figured out a way to curse them. He said, you know, Balak, what you need to do is get a bunch of your pretty little Moabite girls and let them go down to the camp of Israel and start having sex with the boys down there in the camp of Israel. And God will judge them. And he got paid. He got his money. He couldn't curse Israel, but he got his money because he figured out a way to get God to curse his own people. You know something? It tells us in the book of Numbers that two months later, when Israel invaded the land, it says, and Balaam the son of Bosor, they slew with the sword. He got his money. And it lasted two months. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. He was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. That's what God calls it. Having this incredible, insatiable greed for money. It was madness. Now he tells you what these apostates are like. It says these are wells without water. They're clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. You get it? Money and sex, money and sex, money and sex. Keeps coming back to those two issues. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Don't want to get pulled back into that. While they promise them liberty, Christian liberty says that I can drink and smoke and grill with girls that do and uh, 
do whatever else we want to do. They promise liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in other words, these are people who knew the truth, but they twisted it. After they knew, they had the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled with what? The pollutions of the world. And overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to its own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. A lot of these so-called faith healers and miracles and money people fall into the category here. That's why they teach what they do. They follow the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And he died for it. Jude talks about the same group of apostates. Starting in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that you could earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Remember Paul talked about the men who uh, creep in to houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Men like that for the last 2,000 years, well, before that all the way back to the days of Adam and Eve. Silly women, laden with sins, carried away with diverse lusts, and the apostates take advantage of it. Certain men crept in unawares, they're creeps, <laughs> who were before the Lord, old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. They say, grace, grace means you can do anything you want. But in doing this, what does it say? They deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how often we forget things that we should keep in mind. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. You know what? God is like a good football coach. When the players on his team are playing a bad game, what does the coach do? Does he leave them on the field? Or does he jerk them off? He pulls them off and puts somebody else in place, doesn't he? Is this true? Yeah, you've all seen enough football. I mean, I'm not, a, 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 I'm not an expert on football. That was not my sport. But I know that a good coach does not leave a player on the field who's playing for the other team. He destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, he's using some illustrations too. The angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness, under the judgment of the great deed, day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Here we go. Same set of illustrations that Peter gave. The angels, the Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That tells you what God thinks about sodomites. What does it say? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And it's written in the present tense. And that happened 2,000 years before Jude wrote those verses. They don't get burned up. They don't get annihilated. They are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, these filthy dreamers. Who's he talking about? The apostates who are in it for the money and for sex. Likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. They hate authority. They're rebels at spirit. They speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Even Michael, the most powerful of all the angels. There was a war going on over the body of Moses. You remember God took Moses up to the top of the mountain and said, I'm going to let you see the land, but you're never going to go in. And God killed him on the mountain and God buried him. 
But Satan wanted the body. If he could empower that body, what kind of damage could he do with Moses coming down if the body was now under the control of Satan and comes down like a zombie kind of thing and tells the children of Israel to do some horrible thing? Michael the archangel was there. He contended with the devil over the body of Moses. We didn't say, get out of here, you devil, I'm bigger than you are. What did he say? The Lord rebuke thee. Folks, the apostates are under the devil's control. But the apostates don't understand the concept of authority. These speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. What is the animal nature? Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. They perished in the gainsaying of Korah. You see, Peter and Jude are both on the same page because they're getting inspiration by the Holy Spirit. The gainsaying of Korah. Remember Korah and his brethren who rebelled against Moses and the earth opened up and swallowed them down and their families. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you. There we have the same thing again. They show up at your church dinners feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. How much fruit is that kind of tree going to produce? It, it, it's, uh, it has no water. It's blown around with the wind. It, fruit is withered, and it's without fruit because it's twice dead, and it's pulled up by the roots. Look at their lives. Be fruit inspectors. Do they bear the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. They are without fruit. They might be loud. They might be persuasive. They might be dogmatic. Do you see fruit in their lives? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. He's graphic. Wandering stars. You know, when you look up at the sky at night, do the stars sort of look like they're wandering around? No. If you see a wandering star, here's what happens. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? It moves across the sky and out into the darkness of forever. Do you understand why the Bible tells you these are not people that you want to be involved with? And yet, think of all the thousands of Christians that have gotten sucked into the charismatic movement. You know some of them. This is what they're following. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam. By the way, that demonstrates to you that the genealogies of the Old Testament are correct. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. You go back, and Enoch is number seven after Adam. Prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. He got the point. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I tell you something else about these characters. These are murmurers, complainers. You know people who gripe about stuff all the time? Always complaining. Be careful. Those are character qualities of an apostate. Walking after their own lust, their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They, they like to boast and they like to fawn. They boast about themselves and they fawn at the feet of all the important people. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. What motivates them? Is it the flesh or is it the Spirit? What motivates? You can ask yourself the same question. What motivates me? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? 
Be careful because it tells you here that what motivates the apostates is the flesh. How are we to act? He tells you in verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So four things. Number one, build yourself up in the faith. That means learn the word of God. Number two, praying in the Holy Ghost. Don't pray carnal prayers. Make sure your prayers are empowered by the Spirit of God. You can never ask anything from God that Jesus himself wouldn't ask. Anything else is a carnal prayer. Number three, keep yourselves in the love of God. Focus on being in the center of God's will. Number four, and even after all that, you look for mercy. You don't deserve anything. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, as you deal with others, you're going to have to make some questions. Some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Do you know some people that are caught up in this stuff? Your compassion can make a difference. Try to get them out of it. Pull them out of the fire. But you hate the garment spotted by the flesh. Do not let it suck you in or spoil you. And then the verses you hear me say every week. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's in the context of protecting you from this kind of person. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Miracles and money. The two principal motivators for the apostates are money and sex. Be careful those are not the things that motivate you. Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. And God judges and kills idol worshipers among his people. You know, returning from Mexico after the ICCC Aladic Congress, we flew over a gigantic volcano. I've mentioned this to some of you, so bear with me if, if I've already told you the story. But um, we flew over this huge volcano. There was snow on top of it. It had a huge crater. And I actually got a bunch of really great photos from the plane. We were flying at about 38,000 feet because it said so on the little sign above, you know, where you can see your route and how high you are and how fast you're traveling and all that stuff. We we're almost eight miles high. Uh, at the base of the volcano, as I looked out the window, I could see a multiple towns, one of which was a large city. And you know, uh, not long ago, I was eating in a restaurant where there was a, uh, a Mexican waiter and started talking to him. And um, as I talked to him, and I said, and where are you from in Mexico? Found out that he was here. I hope he wasn't, didn't think that I was trying to figure out if he was an illegal after all that's going on between Mexico and the US right now. but. Um, he told me such and such a town. I said, oh, where's that located? He says, oh, there's this one big volcano in Mexico. And, uh, and uh, he described it. And then he said, and off to the side of it, there's this other little smaller hill. And I could see that out the window. So I knew we were talking about the same place. And he said, on top of that, there's this church. And you could see that down there, a big cathedral out the window. And he said, and that's the town that I came from. You know, when I flew over that volcano, and I saw those towns, I was actually praying for the salvation of people in that town. And God led me to a man. That was his hometown. And I gave him a track calendar. And I prayed for his salvation. Do you ever do anything like that? You know, I look, at, I look at that and I wonder what is going to happen to that volcano in the end times. You know, do the people in that little city ever think of Mount St. Helens, which lay dormant for more than a century? I wonder if any of them ever get afraid. I wonder if they've gotten comfortable with their wealth as they work to make money 
and fornicate and cheat and steal and spend their hard-earned savings on tequila. I prayed for that city and the little towns as we flew over that God would raise up a witness, a brave voice for the gospel that would not be afraid to proclaim that judgment is coming. I prayed for great sweeping movement of the Holy Spirit of God to reach those people before it was too late. As I looked down and saw how small they were, I realized nonetheless how important to God that each one of those individuals is. Do you ever think like that when you fly? Do you ever look down and pray for the people whom you'll probably never meet? You know, I often do that as I'm driving and I see people on the street. I did that as I stood in my hotel rooms in the various cities in China when I went over with Daniel and Anastasia for the adoption of the two little boys. Looking down, in some cases, more than 20 stories down on the street. I could see bicycles and people riding in cabs and people walking on the street. I prayed. You see, my body was 12 hours difference, so I couldn't sleep at night, and I wanted to sleep during the day. I prayed for the people that they were getting on the buses and stopping to greet one another. I prayed that God would raise up a witness for himself. I prayed that God would bring a sweeping revival in those cities where I stayed on both trips to China. Do you care? Do you not realize that the end is near? Or do you just yawn and stretch and go about things as usual? Yeah, things as usual. Be careful. Because there's going to be something that will tempt you. One little special thing, just a little thing like Lot, that may result in your death. Lot's wife got turned to a pillar of salt. Lot wanted just a little thing by going to Zor. He ended up in the death of his wife and ultimately incest with his daughters who produced two sons, Moab and Ammon, the ancestors of some of Israel's worst enemies, the Moabites, the ones, who, with help from Balaam, caused the children of Israel to commit fornication. Folks, a lot of important things to learn. Well, I think I'm not going to get into the next section here. Uh, because I only have four minutes, and I think you would like to get out early instead of late tonight. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you will teach us to live the way in which true Christians are supposed to live. That the end of life is not money, the end of life is not sex, the end of life is not power and control, what we're supposed to be doing is bringing glory to God. Thank you, Father, for your word, for the things we've studied tonight. Help us to be able to take the word of God and apply it in a way that brings you the greatest amount of glory. Father, keep us from covetousness. Keep us from lust. Deliver us not into temptation, Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many hurtful lusts, which drown men in perdition and destruction. Father, help us to be content. Help us to learn that you have promised you will never leave us nor forsake us. Keep us from being like Judas. Keep us from being like Ananias and Sapphira. Keep us from being like Elymas the sorcerer. Keep us from being like the seven sons of Sceva. All these illustrations in the book of Acts all center around the same kind of thing. In the religion business for money and power and corruption. Men of destitute minds. Corrupt minds. Destitute from the truth. Cause us to learn to walk by faith and then to rejoice as we see you providing. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.